this. I think you've heard me often enough, it's context that we need to be paying attention to often. Well, prior to this particular reading today, we had Jesus taking his disciples to an old place where the people gathered for worship of another God, Cave of Pan, as they say, in Caesarea Philippi, and other places. He also asked the disciples if they wanted to be their, his followers, that they needed to take up their cross, their own cross, and follow him. It was on the heels of these things and more that the transfiguration took place. And as I said during the children's time, this simple little cup that I use with ashes in it from palms, from the Palm Sunday of the previous year is the tradition. It's a reminder of this time of the year. It's a pivotal time of the year. Just as pivotal, if not more so, than Christmas. And yet it is a time that we sometimes push off to the side because we have our minds and hearts set on other things, such as we joked about the spring coming. But it's not a joke because we are looking forward to it. But within the church, however, we are entering in an extremely important time. Historically speaking, it was a time where new people who wanted to become Christians began their journey. They were taught and they began to learn. And so we carry on this tradition. Pastor Lisa and I and <coughs> Phil were having lessons. Lisa and I focusing on Lent, but Phil on other things. And it's a tradition of leading up to Easter. Leading up to a time where we make a commitment, as Jesus said earlier in chapter 16, of the, before we had today's reading, do you want to be my followers? This is what it's going to take. The transfiguration. As many times as I've read it, and I'm sure as many times as you've heard it, it still strikes me as a very odd thing. We push it off sometimes as being, oh, here we are again, transfiguration. But it is something extraordinary. Just as extraordinary as listening to Shin Wei play music today. Did you know that when, and I don't know music, and you, some of you do, but if she had hit a middle C, I can't, she could probably tell me. But if she had hit a middle C, did you know that the pistons and the bones in your inner ear vibrate exactly 256 times a second on that one little strike? Isn't that awesome? Did you know that each day you think about 50,000 different thoughts every day? Flex your hand with me. Flex your hand. Did you know that by just doing that, you were flexing 70 different muscles? 70. In that simple little motion. The world is amazing. I just named some scientific facts that I, that I dug up recently. You can think of more. And yet we go through the day sometimes as if nothing particularly special is going on. It's always something special. Always something going on. I began to think about things that I have done. Just me alone. Because I forget. It's sort of like, oh yeah, I've done that. Or I've, I've been there. I've, see, I've seen this. And I go, how oh, hum kind of a thing. What's the big deal, you know? But to others, I have to remind myself. And I'm not bragging, I'm just saying this is, I've seen the pyramids of Egypt. I've stood in front of the Sphinx. I've gone through the rock of Gibraltar. Pillars of Hercules, the ancient history called it. The Eiffel Tower, I've flown over the Vatican for Pete's sakes. 
I've gone through the Suez Canal, gone through the Red Sea. I've watched dolphins swim in front of a ship. And on and on I could go. You could do the same. And yet we treat some of these things like, oh yeah, what's the, what's the big deal? There's some people that have never done any of this stuff. Nothing like that. And we treat it as if it's ho-hum. What's the big deal? It's a big deal. The transfiguration is a huge, huge time for the church. Where the disciples began to recognize what was going on. Began to recognize what was going on. How the world was changing all around them. And change is not easy. In my billfold here, I'll pull out a little dollar bill. Why? I remember the comedian George Carlin once made a crack of a joke, said, I put a dollar in a change machine and nothing changed. <laughs> Put a dollar in a change machine and nothing changed. Change is not easy. Again, that's why this time of the year is important. We need to dwell upon and think upon what is the change that is necessary to see what God has truly done and is doing in Christ. It takes some work, some effort on our part. Whether or not we join in a study with Phil or Lisa or myself or do it at home, it takes some effort on your part and on my part. The church is not a place for memorials to be put up and left and forgotten about. That's part of what I see going on with, with the disciples. They want to put up tents on this great mountain. And Jesus goes, no, we need to get off the mountain and go about our work. You know, Phil made the announcement, we need some, some workers for the meals coming up and the food pantry and like that. Well, that's getting off the mountain, getting, getting, you know, getting our hands dirty, getting to work. It's not just talking about it, it's actually walking and doing it. And coming with his, with his health problems and still serving for the men's soup supper. That's what it takes. Not just sitting back and saying somebody else ought to do what it ought to be done but stepping up and doing it because it needs to be done. We are called to do it. Mountaintop experiences, moments come, and then they go away. We cannot bask in the glory of what was and what might be. We need to look at the work that is before us and take our hands and begin to do it. The writer Annie Dilliard said that many of us have not the foggiest idea of the amount of power that we have within our churches. The power that God gives to us to do His work in the world. He said, we don't have the foggiest idea, she said. When we come to church to worship, to hear God's Word, and to sing together, she said, we should be wearing crash helmets. We might need life preservers, a signal flare for help, because the power of God is in our very midst. And yet we act like, oh, hum, it's just another day. The roast is in the oven. The chicken is waiting for us. I wonder if the potatoes are going to be done enough today. Do I need to make a pie for later on? Ho oh, hum, just another Sunday. But Annie Dillier says it's not just another Sunday, and it, it is, never is. When we gather as God's church, we are here as God's people. A life preserver, a flare for help because the power of God is in our very midst. And yet some of you will say, oh, calm down, calm down, calm down. Heavens to murder tribe. I mentioned earlier about the 75 years ago of Iwo Jima and my brother Marines. 
One of the things I remember about the Marine Corps time that I had in North Carolina was running into my sisters and brothers of the Southern Baptist churches. Those folks have a passion sometimes that we United Methodists are not fully capable of at times, I think. Perhaps it's my Highland Norwegian background where you just kind of sit in the pews and, and look at the preacher and go, again, well, supper's waiting. I wonder if he's going to stop talking now. <laughs> no, the Southern Baptists, they have a different take on things at times. They will say things to you and to me like, when were you born again? Now, for me, as a United Methodist, I go, well, I was born again on the day that Christ died for me. And I began to recognize it. So it was a long time ago. But for them, they specifically want to know, and there's nothing wrong with this, that I've come to learn over the years. They want to know that when did they become? When did they begin to recognize? And some of those folks, you might know some, can name you the date and the time when they began to believe in God and Jesus as their Lord and Savior. The time they got saved. You ever heard some of those people talk? One of the authors I was reading this past week said he overheard a young man talking to an older couple. He was so excited. And he even said, I, I read the NIV, New International Version, because it's written on a level that I can understand. Now, somebody might say, well, I love what you can understand. He just needs to be more educated. Why? He's chosen the NIV, and that's a good version to read. And he even went on, he said, that I was saved on February 13th at a certain time of the day. And he, the author said, part of me was growing weary of this childlike explanation for his salvation in Christ. I wanted something, some deep theological dissertation or some nonsense like that. And here I am making fun of this young man who was excited about being born again in Christ. And I found myself growing tired of his voice. And then he began to go, but what if? What if I was that excited about God? What if I was that excited about Christ Jesus? What if the church lived out its life from day to day in such a way that the other world couldn't ignore us in any way, shape, or form? What if Christians were so different? What if we were stood out so much that people would almost get a kink in their neck looking over to see what are they up to today? Like when we go by an accident on the highway, wondering what happened. <clears throat> what if people go, look at that? Look what they're doing. Look at that soup supper that they're doing. Why do they do that soup supper? Or as, as Lisa alluded to earlier, and I was a part of this group, Yahtzee! <laughs> Hallelujah! And here we sit. This is the power of God that we are talking about. I was playing Yahtzee last night, so I know exactly what Lisa means. My mother, when she was alive, when she threw a Yahtzee, she would scream at the top of her lungs, very un Norwegian like. <laughs> It was almost like she was Baptist. She was raised Lutheran. It was amazing to watch her and her excitement on that when she threw a Yahtzee. And see, even as I joke with you like this, we know, don't we? We know these tendencies that we have. There's a part of us that wants something more. We want to truly enter into and to see this, this mountaintop experience that Jesus invited us to today and to understand a bit more what it is. Even though there's another part that goes, just calm down now, calm down. There 
There's nothing wrong with that excitement. Nothing wrong with it at all. And yet still we push back at it. We push back at the fullness of the trust that we are called to have and to live into. Presbyterian pastor, Frederick Meekner, was recalling a very, very low time, a low period in his life years ago. He was terribly depressed. He was depressed because his daughter had an illness that was just not going away. And it was putting a great deal of pressure on the family. He said as he was sitting there one time thinking about his daughter's illness, he noticed a car go by. He was sitting in his car on the roadside because he had been so overcome with emotions. We've been there. Pull the car over, the truck over, and just sit there for a little bit trying to, to get some composure back or find it because of what's going on. He said as he sat there, though, the, another car, as I said, went by, and, and as they went by, he happened to look at the license plate of that car. And the license plate said, trust. It said trust. And Beekner said he was intrigued by that license plate. Intrigued because being a good Presbyterian and being a good Methodist as myself, I probably would have done the same thing had I seen that. Was this a message from God or was it just somebody with a license plate that said trust me? Was it an experience just to laugh off and just kind of a joke? Or was it a message from God? And all these things going, going around. He said, he said, that he was willing to believe that maybe it was a little bit of both. Just happenstance and coincidence. And maybe it was God. Maybe. Well, he wrote about that. He talked about that came to find out that the owner of that car turned out to be a trust officer at a local bank. And after reading about Beekner's writing about this, he found Frederick Beekner and presented him with that license. <laughs> trust. And Beekner placed it on his bookshelf where it serves every day to remind him. He said, and I quote, it's rusty around the edges and a little bit battered. It's also a holy relic, the most holy I've ever seen. You and I, in this world, we are in this community, we are in this time for a season. We don't know how long that season will be. We are entered into a spring season of our physical world, but the season of our life, the season of our place in the kingdom, that too is changing every day, every moment. We are here for a season, for a time period. This is the day of transfiguration, where the disciples witnessed something that was beyond their imagination, beyond anything they'd ever experienced before. We are entering a season called Lent, leading up to Easter. I love Christmas, but this time of the year is the year of the season that I love the most. To truly reflect deeply on what it took from Jesus to save me, to 
save me. Why he gave himself for me. And then pull it back. And why was he so willing to call me to do this? And why has he called you? Amen. Amen.